Good morning. So I'm Alita Hernandez from Nuestro Magazine, and I'm here and honored with David Leopold, correct? That is correct. And um, I have to learn about you. I just got your information. And so let's let the world know about who you are and this beautiful book that you've done. <laughs> well, happy to talk about it and happy. I'm not so important. Uh, I'm just the guy who put it together. The The one that it's important, of course, is the artist Al Hirschfeld. And this is a wonderful collection of his greatest theater work from the last 40 years of his career. Now, he was a uh, caricature, correct? He used to be oh, yeah. And now, did he do it? Because I remember seeing this through my life. He was on many magazines, correct? Like Time Magazine and... Oh, yeah. Like everywhere. Oh, the artwork, it, I remember it as a child, too. You, uh, if you were growing up at any time in the 20th century, uh, you know, from about 1926 on, you could, you really would have a hard time avoiding Hirschfeld's work. It was not only in newspapers all over, uh, it was in magazines like Time, Newsweek, uh, Collier, Saturday Evening Post, uh, eventually the New Yorker. Um, but I mean, it, it 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 was on album covers. There's there's used record stores that just have whole sections of Hirschfeld album covers. Wow. Um, he did more movie posters than you would believe. I mean, we think of him as a theater person, and and of course, the new book is all about his theater work. Right. But he got started in the film industry, and you know, if you look at posters from the original release of The Wizard of Oz, those are by Hirschfeld or Marx Brothers films, or Law and Hardy films, or just oh, so many. It's just really incredible. So he really, he really was an impact in our in our in this in our twentieth century for for art and depicting theater and and depicting their their. Because I was looking at their their like their action. So like Hello Dolly, you know, yeah, or Barbara Streisand. I saw that one, and I remember sure. I remember the artwork. So it's it's incredible that. I didn't know his name, but I remember right. the artwork. So it's incredible that you, you, you're you bringing this to life so people can understand more and why he was doing it and his love for the art, right? Exactly. And, you know, the crazy thing about his work is you say you saw the work, but you didn't know his name. A lot of people saw the work, but the only name they associated with it was his daughters, which he hid throughout his drawings, uh, starting in 1945, he started to hide her name in his drawings. It started off as a, a prank, you know, a little joke for his friends yeah. and families. He was a proud father. Uh, and after a couple of weeks, he stopped doing it. And people started writing in saying, spend all Sunday looking for the Nina. Where is it? <laughs> and he figured it was easier to keep doing it than to uh, to answer all the mail. And a couple of times he tried to stop, but he said he learned the hard way to make sure he put her name in the drawing before he put his name because nobody was looking for his name. <laughs> <laughs> That's cute. That's cute. So the, the daughter has that memory. I'm, I'm assuming, I mean, he has, I assume he has passed, correct? Yes. He lived to be almost a hundred, but he passed away in 2003. Wow. And he awesome. was working up until the day before he died doing incredible work. I mean, he, you know, a, a, a traditionally an arc of an artist's career is they have spent a long time sort of figuring out who they are. They have their peak moment and then there's the inevitable decline. Well, Hirschfeld had an audience in the millions by the time he was 25 and he only became more popular and more successful, literally drawing all the way up until the day before he died. That's, and that's they're awesome. great. The, the, awesome. the drawings at the end of his career are some of the best works he ever did. At a hundred years old, like yeah. A, wow, it's just that's amazing just to think about that that he loved it so much and he kept that and his mind was still incredible in his hand for drawing. Oh yeah, he he subverts every sort of traditional idea. I met him when I was twenty four and he was eighty six, and uh, he probably had a more active social life than most of my peers. <laughs> I mean, all, he was he was going out or having people in all the way to the end. I mean, this was a man who worked every day and went out every night and had a great time doing both things. He had a full life. That's oh, what, without that's, a doubt. That's without what you need to do. I mean, at my age now, I just turned 58 the other day. <laughs> Likewise. And I, and I just opened the studio with my husband. So, and he's a musician. So we are, 
in the social scene all the time and we're here every weekend when there's parties even sure. my, mother, my mother's 85 and mm -hmm. she, she comes out and dances salsa all night <laughs> Well, and that's why, you know, we, we, we're we with our peers. I'm 58 too. And all of our peers are saying, oh, we're getting older. And then you look at someone like your mother at 85 and you realize age is a real mental construct, you know, yeah. sure. I'm not going to be in the Olympics this year, you know, <laughs> next <laughs> Olympics. <laughs> I've given up that dream. Uh, but that means there's still a lot of things you can do and have a really great time. I mean, you live life. That's the important thing. Yeah, and think... it's one of the reasons why we wanted to do this book is this was a book I started to talk about with Hirschfeld uh, three days before he died. We got very excited about it. And then when he passed away, it got put on a shelf. And for a variety of reasons, we didn't get back to it until uh, last year well, really in 2021, when we started to put this all together um, and create not just the book, but uh, an exhibition that is currently at the Museum of Broadway in New York, as well as uh, a live show that we take to theaters to to support theaters, to help them bring back their audiences and uh, to help them raise money. Um, and it, it just feels so good to be able to do that. His work is so accessible and people love it, even if they don't know who it is. You know, people who've never seen his work before see it and are like, oh, they're engaged by it. Yeah. And the more they learn about it, the more they like it. Yeah, because he had, he had his, his drawings were like, um, you know, it was a cartoon, but it was so realistic. And then it showed the emotion of people. So you catch different things from it. So I think that's why people like that. Oh, look how cute that is. Like it gave them a feeling like you got happy or something. You had some kind of emotion from the from the artwork, right? Right. Well, what he, you know, we call him a caricaturist, but he preferred the word characterist because what he saw himself was doing character drawings. And that's what he was so good at. You know, when at the start of his career, he was drawing people like the Marx Brothers or Mae West or Law and Hardy. And those were performers who were caricatures to start off with. So all he had to do was transcribe them. But by the you know 19, mid 1940s, the the American drama changes. You have Tennessee Williams and Arthur Miller and mm. and uh, a whole slew of other playwrights, and they're and they're doing plays about normal people. You come to see the plays for the characters in the show rather than the stars playing them. Laura Wingfield from The Glass Menagerie may be the meekest character in American drama. That should have been the end of a career for a caricaturist. But for Hirschfeld, a meek person has as much character as a flamboyant person. It's mm -hmm. just different things that you pick um, to uh, emphasize. And he used, I mean, when we think of caricature, we think of it as usually a you know, when you say something's a caricature of something, it's usually a put down. You know, it's usually uh, big head, little bodies, anatomical distortion. We're laughing at the person. Right. With Hirschfeld, he uses exaggeration for emphasis rather than for denigration. And I would, you can go through that drawing of uh, Hello, Dolly, or the one of Barbara Streisand and Funny Girl. Sure, it's it's not reality, but it's really not that much exaggerated. It is what those people look like and certainly what their characters were trying to express. And that's why they're so indelible and that they don't age. They look like, uh, uh, we look at a drawing from 1964 and it looks like it was drawn yesterday or maybe it could be drawn tomorrow. Right. That's Work true. doesn't age in that traditional way. That's true. That is true. That the artwork, it doesn't, it doesn't age that way. It doesn't yeah. And, and, you know, for so much of his career, uh, people looked at the drawings and they saw the performers. Oh, Catherine Hepburn, I loved her in this, or Carol Channing or Zero Mostel or any one of a number of the great performers. Well, we're at a time now where those performers are fading in our, in sort of cultural currency. You know, you don't have a lot of people coming in on the weekends talking about uh, Carol Channing. You know, it's just not, yeah. doesn't happen. But it, to me, I look at it like uh, uh, Toulouse-Lautrec. You know, he drew these great uh, Parisian cabaret performers in the late 19th century. I'm sure he re they're really accurate. You know, he caught their essence. 
Well, we don't look at those. We don't. We can't look at that and saying Jane Avril, she was just like that because we don't know. There's nobody alive who ever saw her. We look at them for their aesthetic value rather than their documentary uh, uh, value, and that's what Hirschfeld's drawings. There's a, a audiences today that are looking at his work much like you and I might look at uh, Toulouse Lautrec's work, um, and it's not in, as important to know who the performers are. And in fact, I think audiences today see the work much closer to how Hirschfeld saw it than maybe you and I, because we can get clouded by, oh, she was great in that, I loved her in this. Wow. And whereas an audience today just looks at the drawing. You know, Hirschfeld wanted to create a drawing that could withstand its topical news value, you know, that could stand on its own two feet. And what we're seeing is that's exactly right. Uh, and as we take away the personalities, the drawings remain and they're so strong and they're so engaging and they're just so there's so much pleasure in them. You know, fun. I want to fun makes it seem like it's not important, but that's exactly what it is. He had a joie de vivre that was hard to capture. It's awesome because it's it's 100 years of history. I mean, he's been around oh. for 100. So he's he's depicted so many different things during the political times, during the, you know, all these different things that you can look at as history as well. And oh, sure. You know what oh. was going on during that time. And I don't think uh, people our age and older can appreciate it more than the younger, unfortunately, because we grew up in an era with no phones and no technology. So we were more out to go out to the theater. I, I was born and raised in New York myself. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I understand it. So it, that's why I kind of, I, it kept my, it piqued my, my curiosity because I saw that and I go, Oh, I know that caricature. Like I've seen sure. that before. Sure. What is this? You know? Well, well, that's what's so amazing is his drawings, uh, which appeared in many places, but very famously in the New York times, uh, on average every other week for 75 years. Mm -hmm. uh, he had an 82 year career, not a life, an 82 year career. And uh, those drawings reached everywhere. I grew up in central Pennsylvania. I had no reason to know what was uh, opening on Broadway, you know, this week, right. you know, but I would pick up a, my parents got the Sunday New York Times and we all looked at the drawings and we all knew what was going on, what, what was going on on Broadway. You know, in a sense, he was Broadway's best friend mm -hmm. because all of us were engaged in what was happening in the theater even if we never saw it. Millions more saw his drawings than saw the shows themselves. Only a show like Phantom of the Opera has a bigger audience for the show than for the drawing. But so many of the drawings have been seen much more uh, as drawings rather than the shows themselves. So for many, he he was synonymous with, with Broadway. You know, Hirschfeld was Broadway and vice versa. Right, right, right. Which is great because you can still, I mean, Broadway's still around and... Um... It was, I know it was hard during the pandemic. It was scary. I was sure. like, oh, what's going on in Broadway? Like I couldn't fathom seeing New York empty, you know, like nothing going weird. on. It was very weird. <laughs> it was weird here in Florida. And, and um, but to be, you know, over there had to be very strange with so many millions of people. Well, and what's so wonderful also is that um, Hirschfeld never left Broadway. Uh um, it was announced before he died that they were going to rename the Martin Beck Theater, um, the Al Hirschfeld Theater. And uh, so currently there's a, a on on a, a Broadway is the Al Hirschfeld Theater. And at that theater is uh, the Tony uh, winning best musical Moulin Rouge. Mm. So he's he he has never left. You know, we we're, we I have never lived in an era where Hirschfeld wasn't part of Broadway, either just through the drawings or now through the building. And he's still living, see? We still, you're keeping him alive. And <laughs> this book, so it's incredible, something for the history and for other artists out there to to see, which is great. I Hopefully it gets into, maybe they do a program in a school about it, you know? Well, actually, it's funny you should say that. Uh, the New York City Board of Education created an entire arts curriculum based on Hirschfeld's life and work. <laughs> and and we're now spreading it to, we're taking it to schools all across the country that, you know, the first thing they cut is arts education. Even though uh, every study shows that arts education helps make a better student, make a better citizen, make a better person all the way around, mm -hmm. but they cut it because you can't put a bottom line on it. 
You know, you can't say, oh, well, you can get a job in that. Right. Um, and so we we find that it's a problem. We're, and the and the curriculum is so wonderful, not because it wants to make the next Hirschfeld. It wants to use his work, which is so accessible, to help students K through 12 sort of uh, learn about whether it's visual art or performing arts. Um, there's all kinds of information and, and there's all different ways they use the drawings to uh, educate uh, students. That's wonderful. I'd love to hear that because I'm all for that. That's what yeah. we're trying to do here. We, my, Like I said, my husband's a, a salsa singer, so we have an mm. orchestra and my mother's a pianist. So my family was all into music all the time. And um, so we want to do things here with music because music and art go hand in hand, right? Usually sure. they cut it in school, they cut art and music. So we're trying to do something here um, um, at the studio through the magazine to help intercity kids with music and offer free music classes. And, and now that you talk about that, who knows? I mean, I can do something with the art too. I'm trying to work with the city as well. So sure. we can help the children in the in the neighborhood, especially for those children that can't get there or can't afford it. Right. We we feel it's so important. It you know, it you don't need a lot of money to express yourself through some form of art, whether right. it's painting, drawing, or movement, mm -hmm. or you know, they can learn so much. Uh, I think it really helps prepare people for the tough things in life. If you've been through a cathartic experience in a show, you know, uh, you get it, you know, when, when Romeo and Juliet die, that's the great thing about learning in that you experience that if you're, if you, if you're learning it in school and you experience that when you're faced with it in real life, it's not the first time you've done this. Mm -hmm. And it gives you, uh, some support that, uh, can make you a stronger person. I never and thought help you deal with the life's things. <laughs> I never thought of that. So yeah. I, I took, of course I had to do Romeo and Juliet in high school. And sure. We the show we had to remember the lines and memorize the lines and um and I remember there was a disco song that came out. Do you remember the song that came out, Romeo and Juliet? It was they made it into like a dance. Song. Oh yeah, sure. I, I still have the record. Okay, <laughs> the LP, <laughs> I loved it. So it, it's interesting because I never thought of that. It, it probably did. It probably did help me during my life learning about that and a lot of the other literature that we had in school that had kind of a, a moral to the story that now I don't know why they're taking them out of school but that's another story <laughs> that's another story but I mean music too you know uh, a soaring uh, anthem song that you hear can really you know spur you on to do great things the oh, ballads yeah. that you know you experience sort of the depth of a ballad and then when life gives you that you kind of know what it feels like and yeah. you have the strength to to go on. I, I, I'm i a big believer in that. And I feel that people who do not have experience with art are, are facing life without a really important uh, um, uh, helper. You know, yeah. it's it, yeah. it's, it's, it's a support. Uh, uh, I can't imagine life without it, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'll tell you a little story. So when I, I had a stroke six years ago and I had to change my life, and that's, I have a podcast about that. But mm. um, so when I had the stroke, I went to my acupuncturist. And the first thing mm. he said to me, because I'm very technical, so I'm always doing the other side of the brain, even though right. I'm, I'm creative, but I'm very technical. So he said, start drawing. So the first mm. thing I did was buy adult coloring books. And I would sit home and do coloring and draw. Mm. And that was my therapy. That was my job. My homework was to do art, to stimulate the other side of my brain. Okay, that was fine because I affected the, the technology side, I guess, or whatever. And right. um, so I had to get the he said, you gotta you gotta put the juices in the creative side now. So you gotta draw, you gotta listen to music, you gotta do all this stuff. And that's what I did. <laughs> and so, it made a difference, you it know. It did make it's... a difference. And I still I'm always I'm always doing like I do graphics on the computer and things like that. But it sure. is it's very different when you draw on a piece of paper. There's something about the paper and the pen and you, you have to have the connection to the paper. It's not like yeah. on the computer, you can design something, but it's not the same. It's and not the same. Hirschfeld said he was down to a, a pencil, a pen and a bottle of ink. And he hoped to one day get rid of the pencil, you know, <laughs> so he could just draw free, you know, uh, and his drawings look that way, but they were actually the product of a lot of hard work. Oh yeah. 
Oh yeah, that's awesome. And this is awesome. I, I'm happy I spoke to you and I found this. I really, I hope that other people really get engaged with the book. And I know sure. you have a book. We'll we'll put a link there so people can find they can buy the book, correct? Oh yeah, that would be wonderful. And they can visit alhirschfeldfoundation.org and they can look up everything that Hirschfeld's ever done. Uh, there's over 10,000 entries in there and uh, over 7,000 images. Um, and we also have online exhibitions and you can, you know, you can look at, at the drawings in a lot of different ways by performer, by production, by publication, by year, by theater season, you know, it's all that. Wow, we we try to make it, <laughs> well, I've been doing this for more than 30 years. You know, oh, I started wow. working with Hirschfeld. Oh, wow. Uh, we, uh, I started, uh, uh, I was doing research for an exhibition and uh, I needed, I figured Hirschfeld might have some information on an artist that I was doing some research on. And I contacted him. He was in the phone book. You know, I was too scared to call him. I was 23 years old at the time. And I thought you don't call, you know, Al Hirschfeld. But uh, I wrote him a letter and he wrote me back the probably the warmest letter I've ever received from somebody who was not a family member. And he invited me next time I was in Fun City to come up some, and quaff some tea. <laughs> and uh, I did, and I went up there, and and within a few weeks, I was working, organizing his work. And what what's so amazing is it, it, was, it was all of a piece. It was very, um, it, it wasn't formal. It wasn't anything like that. It was, uh, you know, this man let me into his life. And what we've been doing, I, so I cataloged a, a significant chunk in the 13 years I would visit him about once a week, sometimes more than once a week. Um, and since then, I mean, we do all kinds of things. The the art education is just one end, putting out books, putting on exhibitions. We do all kinds of exhibitions in all kinds of places to not only, you know, of course it's wonderful, people love to see the work, but we have ulterior motives in helping uh, whether it's a theater or a museum, generate an audience. You know, we've gone and done shows at small museums because we know we can have a bigger impact there for them. You know, because supporting arts organizations, writing checks is wonderful. Don't get me wrong. Everybody should support their local arts organization, get a subscription, give a gift, whatever. Um, but we want to help them. We, we help them by bringing audiences to them because that's a lifeline for any type of arts organization. They need an audience. I mean, performing arts is the only art form in which you need other people in which to do it. You know, the painter, he can do his work in a studio and then go on to the next one. Right. An actor or a singer does not have that. They need the audience to get the response. Right, right. Well, that's great. Well, I'll, I'll definitely keep in touch with you because, um, but they're working on some stuff here in Fort Lauderdale. We have a big art district that we're they're working mm. on here. And I'm working with the city to put on some festivals with music and, of course, bringing artists out here. So I would love that show to be here. So I'll get more information for you and we'll keep in touch so that way we can get the show here. And sure. even maybe a nice VIP intimate. I, I only hold about 125 people at my place. So it's an intimate studio sure no, that's uh, we work in all kinds of spaces yeah you know it's it's really interesting I'm, like, I'm looking forward to going through the whole book i just went through some of it and i was like oh boy it just made me happy i'm like look i remember that oh, it's all of a sudden i remember like a little girl i remember seeing that i remember seeing that sure sure <laughs> so no, I, was no. just, I was just his... thinking if, if if he was around his his instagram account would be like 25 million you know what i mean like yeah. his time you know what i'm saying we just started one, and in the last two weeks, we've gotten over uh, 250 people that just joined up. We don't do anything fancy. We just post things all the time. We're on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and we now post things there every day because we can do for, on this date in history, and there are 12 drawings to, to choose from. Oh, wow. they, go look he at was that. so ubiquitous, and he was the career goes on for so long. You know, it's it's amazing. And it was all published. You know, he did he didn't draw to, just for himself. Almost everything he did was on assignment from somebody. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's all been published and it's it's all wonderful. Wow. Wow. So you have a big job. Are you still categorizing art? I mean, he well, have... we 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 feel like we've cataloged a good we know we've gotten 85 to 90 percent 
but literally uh, a, a month doesn't go by where someone doesn't bring us something. And all of a sudden we realize, oh, we didn't have this before. Wow. <laughs> uh, because Hirschfeld was, he, he believed in work. You know, it, he didn't see it as work. He said the only work he ever did was in his garden. <laughs> he loved to draw. He said he contracted a sickness for drawing very early in life. And so he was always drawing. And, you know, he was fortunate to be working during a period where uh, print publications were king. Yeah. You know, there were there were hundreds of publications to there were 14 newspapers in New York, <laughs> just true. in New York. So uh, so he 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 was the right artist at the right time. And uh, he loved to draw and everybody knew that. So art directors were always calling him and saying, hey, will you do this? Sure. You know, whether it was a theater poster or drawing for a paper or Columbia Records calling him and saying Aerosmith's coming out with a new record called Draw the Line. We think it would be good to have a Hirschfeld cover. And so Hirschfeld at 74 years old goes up and meets Aerosmith for the first time. <laughs> And does a drawing of them that is so good, they still use it because it looks just like them. You know, he was a great portrait artist. It's why his his work is collected by the National Portrait Gallery, both here and in other countries. Um, he was a, he was a fine artist. So now when I go looking for my LPs, when I go to the thrift stores, I'm going to start looking for Hirschfeld covers now. <laughs> oh, you're going to find them. There's a lot of them. Because we decorated our, our logo here for the studio as a record. You know, oh, no 33, kidding. so Studio 33. And then I have, oh, records, I have records on the walls in the bathroom, on the bar. So I have records everywhere. Oh, that is wonderful. Yeah. That so, is really, really wonderful. Well, David, thank you so much. I will put all your information about where we can find you on all the social media, your website, and everybody interested in your book that you just came out with, with all his artwork. Sure. And, um, I appreciate your time. And Likewise, this has been great. I've learned so much too. This is awesome. So I'm, oh, I'm so glad. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, Arna. Have a great day. Okay. You too. Bye bye. bye. As a leader, Hernandez with Nuestro Magazine just completed an incredible interview here with with David, who is the editor of the book of Al Hirschfield Life of almost 100 years of artwork. Awesome. Please check out my post here. All the information will be here below. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel, Westville Magazine. You never know who I'm going to interview, English or Spanish. So stay tuned. Have a great day, everybody.